Well, good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I know things are, are difficult at the moment. A um, lot of things uncertain. And part of the reason for that uncertainty, of course, is coronavirus. And it's it's like someone took the world and, and just in January and just shook it. <laughs> Everything is is um, well very very different to this time last year. So what I wanted to do this evening was take you through the Coronavirus Act. Now, this is the legislation that was passed, uh, the, the emergency legislation that was passed, and it gave absolutely unprecedented power to the government. That's the, the thing, with, the problem, I guess, with legislation is that it can sometimes be really difficult to predict how it's going to be interpreted. And when you have judges who are effectively political activists, it may well be interpreted in a way that wouldn't be beneficial to people with my politics, for example. But in any case, it, it's it's vague, in other words, and, and open to to great deals of interpretation, and that's always dangerous. It's like the Human Rights Act and uh, the uh, Racism, Religious Hatred Act. Too much in it can be is open to varied interpretation and that so that makes it very powerful a piece of legislation that is open to wide interpretation is very dangerous for from the perspective of the people and very beneficial from the perspective of the powerful so let's go through it in some detail I won't read it don't worry um, and I have Found, rather than go through the Act, because the way uh, uh, Acts of Parliament are written is incredibly tedious and monotonous and, and you have to go from here to here and back and back to this section. It's, it's I, I did it for years. <laughs> it's a bit of a nightmare. So I'll read you a summarised version. I will link to the um, to the legislation itself for those who want to read it and read you out some summaries of it. So early on in the legislation is largely about the NHS and mitigating any you know an NHS crisis and this of course was what we were told was the main reason for the lockdown which was to protect the NHS so I'll read you how the various sections of it are summarized so sections two to nine mitigating NHS staffing shortages and the act here enables the registration of recently retired health and social care professionals medical students uh, and their training and, and, and people who have recently left so essentially what this does is allow for the bringing in of health professionals who are not working so retired um, students to help to to the volunteering process essentially that was set up for the nhs is covered in sections two to nine sections 10 and 14 to 17 uh talk about again about the nhs and local authority resources um they are for example allow the delayed assessments of a patient's need for ongoing nursing care before discharging the Act eases in exceptional circumstances the requirements on local authorities to conduct a needs assessment. That's actually quite significant because uh, it, it, uh, local authorities are required to care for the people in their vicinity. And uh, it seems that this has essentially been knocked on the head uh, for, the, for the time being. It's quite if you're an adult in need of care and support from your local authority and they no longer for a, for a period have no uh, obligation to you that that matters quite a lot interest or uh, significantly the I, this is also in the same uh, region of, of the legislation the act allows for powers to detain and treat patients for mental health disorders to be implemented using the opinion of fewer medical professionals. Um, a little bit chilling, that, actually. OK, reducing administrative staff on, or, or in administrative burden on frontline staff is covered in, in uh, 18 to 21 and 30 to 32. Nothing of particular, um, if you're particularly interested in administration, it's fascinating. Um, but one thing, it, one thing, it really, one thing that sticks out and which really is worthy of note and is really quite significant is that the act removes the requirement that any inquests into a death from coronavirus be held with a jury in England 
Wales and Northern Ireland. So they're uh, uh, removing the requirement for inquests into deaths from coronavirus. Now, this is very worrying. It's worrying because we're not clear on the numbers. And we know we've got at least lots of anecdotal evidence that uh, people are described as coronavirus death even when the death was caused by something else. So we're sort of randomly or willy-nilly handing out uh, coronavirus death when it may or may not have been. And we're knocking on the head again the requirement to uh, for an inquest. Now this... We know the, the numbers are important in all this because the numbers of infections and the number of deaths are what are determining public policy. So we need to know what those numbers are. And remember, we, the advisors have got this rather wrong in the past. So we, we need accurate numbers to know what we're dealing with. And if we are re dispensing the requirement for inquests at a time when we would actually need inquests and at a time when we are aware of and concerned about that deaths are not actually coronavirus deaths at all, are being recorded as coronavirus deaths, therefore driving up the numbers, therefore affecting public policy. This really, really matters. Here's another interesting one. Indemnity. The Act enables the Secretary of State and ministers in devolved administrations to provide an indemnity for clinical neg negligence liabilities from NHS activities. Uh, who's going to pay for uh, the, the, the taxpayer? The taxpayer is going to be heavily, heavily burdened in all of this. Uh, Fifty eight talks about uh, it, it's. It's. I'm not going through this in uh, in chronological order. Twenty sections twenty to twenty three modifying requirements under the Investigatory Powers Act. Now, essentially what this does is allow for the recruiting, or the recruiting of extra judicial commissioners. These are people who have to approve um, investigatory powers, warrants, investigation warrants. And essentially they're, they're allowing for the appointment of more of those on a temporary basis. Nothing particularly controversial there. Here's one that is slightly controversial though. 24. The Act allows the government to extend the period for which fingerprints and DNA profiles may be retained for up to six months if the Secretary of State considers that coronavirus is having or is likely to have an adverse effect on the capacity of those for, responsible for national security decisions and it is in the interests of national security to retain fingerprints and DNA profiles. Uh, well, we, look, we've already, we already know that the Secretary of State has the immense power uh, to to take away our, our civil liberties. And we've never seen it more uh, starkly revealed to us than we have now. We need to get, we need to reverse all of this at the end of coronavirus. And that's the, that's the, that's the issue. The Secretary of State needs reining in. And that's why I have long advocated for a constitution that will not allow the Secretary of State to willy-nilly take away our, our civil rights or indeed allow the uh, police to retain fingerprints and DNA profiles um, if it's unnecessarily. It's, all, it's just all very... I mean, you may not be overly concerned about that and perhaps it's not the most concerning thing on there by a long stretch, but all of it just screams police state... And that police state may not be easy to get rid of on the other side of this, if there is another side of this. I don't know if we're going to have an identifiable other side of this. Here's one that is controversial. Suspending port operations, section 50. The Act provides powers to suspend port operations if shortages in border staff mean there are insufficient resources to secure the border. Well, anyone would think by reading that, that we had a secure border, that we had a border at all, and then they're even suspending the border force if they don't have sufficient resources to secure the border. 
This is farcical. We know that the Border Force has plenty of resources to go out into the English Channel and take illegal immigrants and bring them back to the UK. The very opposite of what they're actually supposed to do. So the whole thing is a farce anyway. It was a farce before coronavirus and it will be a farce after coronavirus. There is no securing of our borders. There is no border. There isn't, despite the rhetoric from Johnson and Patel. No border. Powers relating to potentially infectious persons. The government has already passed secondary legislation to give public officials in England emergency powers to test, isolate and detain a person where they have reasonable grounds to think the person is infected. The Act puts the powers on a statutory footing and extends them to authorities across the whole UK. Someone who breaches a direction given under these powers commits an offence and is punishable by crime. This is their able to, uh, if they think, this is what I, thought I talk about, where they have reasonable grounds to think that a person is infected. So if I cough, they have reasonable grounds to think that I am infected. And knowing who will be applying these laws, a loony left local councils and a complicit police force, a police force that literally gets down on its knees to Black Lives Matter, a communist anarchist group, if on, on, on a mission, a current mission to destroy and dismantle British society. The police get down on their knees to them. This is who will be uh, left to decide what are reasonable grounds, what reasonable grounds they have to detain and test and isolate you. Understand that the police, the police who get on their knees to Black Lives Matter, the same police have the power to test, isolate and detain you if they have reasonable grounds to think you are infected. Take that in and, and, and absorb the enormity of it. Powers regarding public gatherings and premises. The Act gives ministers, including in devolved administrations, the power to restrict or prohibit gatherings or events and the power to close or restrict access to premises. We have never, perhaps not, not, certainly not for a long time, not since I can remember, with the dismantling of our, our culture and society that's going on now while our government watches, we've never needed more to be able to gather, to meet, to discuss. And we've never needed our recreation more either because it's a really, really difficult time. And, and, and normally in Britain, we like to let down our hair with our friends. We like to go and see a film or have a meal or go to the pub. We can do none of that. Our recreation has been cut off from us as well. And the ministers have the power to close down gatherings, events and restrict access to premises or close them. Now, the minister can only use this power if they have made an official declaration that the virus constitutes a serious and imminent threat to public health and that using the powers would either help to control the transmission of the virus or would facilitate the most appropriate deployment of medical emer emergency resources. Once again, this is... We have no power in all of this. The civil, there's no civil rights. There are no civil rights in any of this legislation. All this legislation does is remove civil rights and place, take all of our individual power away and place it in the, in the hands of government and devolved ministers and local councils and police, all of whom have the discretion to decide whether or not to allow you to do basic everyday things we took for granted not six months ago here in the UK. It is up to the very people that we are opposing the up to the very people who are taking our liberties away to decide when to give them back. This is total, total control by the government. So uh, where are we? I'm just going to go through some of the least uh, contentious ones. A couple of um, uh, things regarding differences in, in, in Scotland. I'll go through schools. Schools are covered in 37, 38. The Act gives ministers, including in the devolved administrations, the power to require the temporary closure of a school or registered health care or registered child care provider. 
again, it, it's just immense, immense power in the hands of the government. Absolutely no recourse. Nothing. There's nothing. There's no checks and balances in here. There's no ability for the local for for the people to hold local authorities to account for example there's no there's there's no there are no civil liberties is the only way i can describe it and there's a glaring removal of civil liberties section after section after section and nothing in there to reassure us that the um that are, that we still have some ability to challenge for example so if the police erroneously punish us if the police interpret this stuff all too widely for their own political agenda their own political beliefs and interpret as they do with legislation there's no there's no protection is what, I, what i'm trying to say there's no protection at all in here there's no uh, signposting to protection it's all you have no liberty you have no liberty you have no liberty it's immense intense complete unlimited power in the hands of the established state and nothing in there giving us a recourse for misuse of this legislation Uh, there's been an expansion in uh, technology in court. You can already use an, a technology in court for vulnerable witnesses to give testimony, for example. This is now uh, obviously been expanded so that anyone really can uh, uh, video link. Statutory stick pay. The, the Act enables the government to make regulations to allow certain employers to reclaim the cost of providing statutory stick pay to their employees for COVID-19 related absences. Um, fairly uncontroversial there except for the fact that of course even more uh money uh, even, even greater strain on the public purse rules preventing those in receipt of nhs pensions returning to work will be suspended well, that's um, again fairly uncontroversial let me move down a little bit The May 2020 elections. The Act postpones elections due in May 2020 for local councillors, mayors of local and combined authorities, police commissioners, the Mayor of London and the London Assembly until May 2021. Again, seems uncontroversial, but we have to make sure they don't extend this. What if we're extended again? But, you know, if what if when we get to May 2021, it's, it's still unsafe and the minister responsible deems it unsafe because all of the power here is in the hands of ministers and that while that's usually the case we also have recourse we have avenues for misuse this isn't isn't in here uh, and we've got to make sure and, and what we, we why i say we've got to make sure we we get all these freedoms back at the end of this if there is an end to this this is one this is one we have to keep a very, very, very close eye on and make sure we don't have indefinite extensions of elections because things are happening in our country right now. Enormous things. And our way of fighting back is, is the ballot box. They can't take the ballot box away from us. I, 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 really, I really think this one has to be watched very very closely to make sure they don't kick elections down the road even further so all elections as a further uh it, it goes on to say that uh the act also postpones any by-elections to local authorities westminster devolved legislatures or other electoral events until may 2021 keep a very very close eye on that uh, power to turn provisions on and off. This allows UK ministers, in some cases ministers of the devolved administrations, to make regulations to turn some measures in the Act on and off as needed. How about that for power? Ministers may make different regulations for different purposes or areas. Many measures, including powers related to potentially infectious people and to limit events and gatherings cannot be turned on and off in this way. So they specify uh, the powers that can't be turned on and off, but there are still powers that need, and they don't specify which powers can be turned on and off. It doesn't, for example, say that calling elections can uh, is, is in the, uh, the, the remit of things that cannot be turned on and off. It is, I, I can't, I can't get across to you quite what a power grab this is this is un this is unlimited power
How long will measures last for? Most of the Act will stop having effect two years after it's passed. Some provisions, including certain provisions relating to the emergency registration of health professionals and indemnity of health service activity, do not expire after two years. Following government amendments in the Commons, MPs will have an opportunity to express a view on the continued operation of the Act's temporary provisions every six months. Every six months, a minister must, as far as is practicable, make arrangements for MPs to vote to keep the provisions of the Act in force. If MPs are able to vote and vote to stop, and vote to vote to stop against keeping the provisions of the Act. I assume that stop shouldn't be there. Vote to vote against keeping the provisions of the Act in force. The government must make regulations to prevent provisions having effect within 21 days. MPs will only be able to vote on the continuation of the powers if Parliament is sitting. If they are not able to vote, the powers will remain in force. Do you know, I've never been... I don't believe in conspiracies, and I don't believe in a conspiracy now either... But this is what conspiracy theorists talk about when they talk about seizing power. This is a nightmare for a conspiracy theorist, this piece of legislation. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's everything that they warn against. It's the kind of thing that you would dismiss as crazy if a conspiracy theorist told you the government was going to take this much power in a single piece of legislation passed through Parliament in a hurry. If, if a conspiracy theorist told you that, that this was going to happen in 2020, that the government was going to, the parliament was going to pass this legislation, you would not have believed them. You would have dismissed them. But we, everything, everything has changed. Everything. And while that may sound like a negative, it isn't in so many respects. It has shown us how powerless we can be made and how easily and this, again, is why we need a UK constitution, and I will keep arguing for one. But this is a turning point. This is crunch time. The government currently holds the power to dictate and determine every aspect of our lives. And the Parliament took that power, and it's now up to Parliament to give it back according to the very laws that they passed to restrict our every action in our daily lives. We're going to see a new society at the end of this. We're going to see, I suspect and I fear, a society where we will not be able to sit next to each other. Cinemas, theatres, etc. will be hugely impacted. Our social life, our socialising will never be the same again. Our service provision will never be the same again. Our economy will never be the same again. And in that great change comes great change. And that great change, I know and hope, and I know you're with me on this, will be to retake Great Britain from the insanity that has been holding our great country hostage for decades now. Subtly, but now in plain view. It's our time to fight back and take back our country from these dangerous politicians who have taken all of our civil liberties. We can and will get them back, but keep a very, very close eye on this government. They have limitless power now. Let's remember our own power. Never ever forget your own power, by the way. Keep fighting. If, you, if we are allowed to have elections next May, stand. Stand and reclaim your civil liberties. It's the only way we are going to be able to do it. Thanks for joining me this evening. Uh, please do let me know any comments, any thoughts you have on all of this. And remember to keep positive. Keep your head high. Out of darkness comes light. And out of this darkness will come the light of saving Great Britain. Thank you sincerely to every one of you for your support, for your encouragement and for your passion for this country. It inspires me every day. I shall see you on my live stream on Monday, where I'll be talking about, again, the state of our world at the moment and what we must do to save it. See you on Monday.